My name is Richard Pickering and I'm making this video in response to a movie called Gasland. It's a documentary based on oil field, uh, an oil field procedure called hydraulic fracturing. That's a process we use to make it make wells more profitable. It, uh, it's actually a process that breaks the rocks around the well bore and allows the gas to flow back or oil flow back better and makes the wells more productive and more lucrative. Uh, the movie itself is based on the hazards involved with that and prioritizes mainly in uh, water contamination. Uh, if you've seen the movie as I have, then you understand that it's got some pretty alarming content. Uh, there's, I mean, if you've seen it, then you know there's the guy who lights his sink on fire and, and, and among other things, dead animals and just disturbing things, just, you know, things that are really bothersome. And if you've seen it, then it's probably bothered you because it bothered me. <coughs> but... I myself work in the oil field, so in making this video I am biased towards an oil field side, but I, 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 I've done my best here to, to make a video and to, to make it unbiased and to really look into each individual case and, and find the truth and not just go off of what the documentary said or what I have up conjured in my own mind because trust me I I have a tendency to do that but to actually go to the actual websites of the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission to the uh, EPA to the Pennsylvania EPA and look at each individual case and see what the findings were of uh, and what actually happened and that's what I've done and that's what I'd like to present to you uh, <clears throat> before I start I'd like to explain a few things about uh, natural gas uh, natural gas or methane is, is it's just a hydrocarbon it's naturally occurring and it's flammable it's an energy source uh, we burn it and we create energy with it and it, it it's it's extremely abundant in the United States it's a, and it's an extremely lucrative thing because we use a lot of it any energy is extremely lucrative if it works well most uh, <coughs> most green energies don't work very well and that's why they're not very lucrative and that's why they don't really work I'm all for energy that, that works well. It, natural gas is a clean energy that works well. And uh, there are hazards involved in it, but they can, they, they, they can really be kept to a minimum. But anyway, let me move on. Uh, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> I'm explaining some things about uh, natural gas. It's a hydrocarbon. It, it's naturally occurring. Uh, there's two different types of methane. There's a biogenic type that is, uh, it's, it's common in shallow, shallow land, real shallow, or even in swamps and stuff. And, it, and it's made through a process, uh, the decomposition of organic material through fermentation. So it's just from rotting, really, I mean, fermentation. Uh, and then there's thermogenic methane, which is, is what we drill for. And it's made through the same process, really. It's just a buried, it, it's decomposition of buried organic material and uh, it, it requires a lot of heat and pressure in order and that's why it's in rocks it it's a different kind but <clears throat> in doing that it it makes it a different type of methane and that's what we actually drill for and that's what we go for and that's why we have to frack it and break the rock around it or that it's in to allow it to flow back easier but so there's two different types. There's biogenic and thermogenic, and thermogenic is what we drill for. So if you remember that, that would be plenty. Uh, <clears throat> now, the the way that they tell the difference between the two is a pretty accepted method. It's scientific. If there's a, they can either do a stable isotope analysis, which is chemistry. Uh, I don't want to get into all that, but that's a that's a way or there's just a compositional analysis of the methane that, that they look at what's in it. Because biogenic methane is, is usually just almost all methane. I mean, it's pure methane. Almost. There's some traces of other kinds. But uh, uh, thermogenic methane contains a lot of heavier hydrocarbons. It contains uh, butane, pentane, hexane, uh, you know, it, it has heavier hydrocarbons in it. And that's how they can tell the difference. They can just look at the composition and then they can decide from those, from those findings what type of uh, methane it is. And <clears throat> so, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I need to tell you before we really get into this. Uh, 
basically just remember biogenic is is shallow through fermentation and thermogenic is the methane that we drill. All right, so we're just going to get started right on to some of the cases from the movie. And we're going to start out with these Weld County wells. There's three individual cases that we're going to talk about. Uh, before we get started, let me tell you that my laptop is sitting right here and I'm going to be glancing over at it because I'm going to be reading some of these reports and I don't want to get the information inaccurate. I want to be as accurate as I can, so that's what I'm looking at over here, but anyway, it shouldn't matter. Uh, okay, we're going to, there's three individual cases we're going to talk about with the Weld County Wells. There's the, uh, the Markham case, the McClure case, and the Ellsworth case, and <clears throat> they all three were in that area, but we'll start out with the Ellsworth case because it was a separate case, and when they looked into it, they actually found a mixture of biogenic and thermogenic uh, methane and it was attributed to oil and gas production and that's partially what caused it and uh, the Ellsworths came to an agreement with the uh, with the oil and gas company and I don't know if they fixed their well or if they drilled them another one I, I really don't know because they came to an agreement and that's really their business so uh, but with the Markham case and the McClure case, those were separate cases, and when they were looked into, they <coughs> were they they found just biogenic methane. But uh, I want to go ahead and tell you the worst part about the Markham case is he's the guy that actually lights his uh, uh, faucet on fire, the original guy that you know, the fire starter. But anyway. Uh, the worst part about it is the fact that the, the the very first time that they looked into it was in 1976. They the the first in uh, let me look real quick, make sure that I don't get anything wrong. Yeah, the the very first publication from the Colorado Division of Water Resources was in 1976, and what it states is that the aquifer contains troublesome amounts of methane from a biogenic source. That was in '76. In '83, the public the <coughs> publication by the United States Geological Survey similarly states that methane-rich gas commonly occurs in groundwater in the Denver Basin, uh, southern Weld County, Colorado. And in 2001, report by Colorado uh, Geological Survey discusses the methane potential for this formation and cites approximately 30 other publications made about the this well and this aquifer. The thing is, is that the aquifer that they draw from goes down through four separate coal beds coal methane beds with biogenic methane and that's that's where their methane comes from the the thing about it is is that it's it's actually not going to hurt them and that's why they don't have to do anything about it i mean whoever's rely I, I haven't looked into it but i would imagine whoever's responsible for the aquifer whether it's the state the city or some private contractor i don't know you know i haven't looked into that but if if the biogenic methane being in the drinking water was harmful at all, they would have to do something about it, but it's not. Don't get me wrong, nobody wants flammable water, that's ridiculous. But it's not due to anything but a naturally occurring methane bed that their aquifer draws from, and that's why their water's flammable, and they've known it since 1976. So that's the truth about the Markham case. <coughs> McClure case, same aquifer that they draw from, it's the let me look real quick to make sure that I get it correct. Yeah, it's the Laramie Fox Hills Aquifer. And it's just got a lot of methane in it, and that's the end of the story. So that's the Weld County Wells. Alright, now we're going to get to the West Divide Seeps. And in the movie, uh, in the movie it depicts, there's two different seeps in, in, that are in close proximity to each other, and they're in the Peons Basin in Garfield County, Colorado. And they, they're, they're close to each other, but they're both caused from different origins. And first we're going to get to the one that had to do with oil and gas production. And in the movie it depicts them both as the same seep, and both, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, and that both of them were caused by hydraulic fracking. That's inaccurate. It's a total, it's a lie, actually, which is just unacceptable to me. But anyway, uh, in the seep that's not, there's Lisa Bracken is in the movie, uh, we'll get to her in a minute, but the seep that's in proximity to her property and has nothing to do with hers and comes from a different origin does it is caused by oil and gas production, and it's but it's not caused by hydraulic fracking. It's caused by a bad cement job. And after I get done 
talking to you about each individual case, we'll, we'll get into that because I want to explain to you the actual hazards involved in drilling a gas and oil and gas well and what can happen if you use bad practices and what actually causes uh, contamination of drinking water. I mean, because it can happen, and it does, and, excuse me, oh, we'll get into that. But anyway, let's get back to Lisa Bracken. Lisa Bracken <coughs> has complained about the seep on her property for a long time. Uh, let me, let me look. Uh, they've taken nine gas samples in six different occasions during 2004, 2007, 2009, and 2010. With respect to each sample, the gas composition was found to be 100% methane in every one that they took of hers. Uh, no heavier hydrocarbons was detected, and the stable isotope ratio indicated that gas was biogenic. So, this is the woman who, in the movie, has the, uh, the frozen dead animals wrapped in uh, Walmart bags in her freezer that are probably still there today, which is... Yeah, it's a little bit of a weird hobby, but to each their own. Yeah, okay. Sorry, but anyway. Uh, so, <coughs> that's, that's the truth behind her case. The truth is it's been investigated all the way back since 2004. And it's biogenic methane. She knew it when they made the movie. Josh Fox knew it when they made the movie. So it's just really irresponsible and unethical journalism is what it boils down to. It's, it's, it's really... The more I looked into it, the more I realized how disgusting of a display that it really is. I mean, it's just, it's politically motivated, ideologically motivated, money motivated trash. I'm sorry, I know that's my opinion, but that's the truth. When, when, you, make a, when you make a movie, you can do what you want. That, that's fine. Make things up. But when you make a factual-based documentary... You use facts, even if they go against what you believe. Do you, you think I want to tell you that there was a gas seep caused by a bad cement job? No. It goes against what I like, which is drilling holes in the ground for energy, because it brings us our life as we know it. But I will tell you the facts. That's the fact. All right. The other seep was caused by oil and gas production. On the Ellsworth property was caused by oil and gas production. There's a mixture there. and it, it <coughs> In the area that she's in, there was biogenic, because she would have had it anyway, but it's still unacceptable because it's due to bad practices. Before we get into these bad practices, I want to get into some more some more things about the movies. First of all, in the movie, uh, it, it just depicts a few other things that I want to discredit, basically. <laughs> okay, uh, it says that that they use uh, 596 chemicals to frack a well and that uh, nobody even knows what they are. The people pumping them don't even know what they are. Well, that's totally inaccurate, okay? There's not a single chemical on location on a drilling site well by, by OSHA standards, federal standards, that you don't have an MSDS about, that you don't know everything about, and you don't know the hazards involved, how to clean it up, how to treat it if you get contacted. Uh, I mean, that's just federal law. And everybody on location knows what they're mixing and knows what they're dealing with. The majority of the chemicals are 100% safe. I mean, that's just the truth, okay? Now, 99.9% .9 of what gets pumped into the ground during a fracking operation is water and sand. Now, don't get me wrong, 0.01% of really bad chemicals is not a good thing. And there's things in it that you don't want to put in your drinking water. Trust me, I, I, I'm not trying to paint it any way. But, <clears throat> the truth of the matter is, but we know what we're putting into the ground. Uh, as I was editing this together, I realized that I missed a whole uh, case that I wanted to talk about, and it was the, the, <coughs> the excuse me, the Dunkard Creek in uh, Washington County, Pennsylvania. It's that 35-mile stretch of uh, creek that had all the dead fish, and pretty much everything in it was dead. Uh, in the movie, they depict that it was caused by oil and gas production and fracking, but the real truth is that it had nothing to do with fracking and that's just the truth. I have an EPA report right here that states their findings, and it says that uh, upon further investigation of Dunkard Creek, we found that toxins from a golden algae bloom led to the kill of fish, mussels, salamanders of Dunkard Creek. The situation in Dunkard Creek should be considered a chronic exposure since chloride levels were elevated above the 
<coughs> above the criteria for long periods of time, issued 11-23 of 09. So that's that's the truth. All right, so now we're just going to get in directly into uh, what what the actual real causes of water contamination when you're drilling an oil and gas well, what really happens and what causes it, because it does happen, and, it, and, and there are bad practices that can lead to water contamination or communication between two different uh, zones, which is really bad. Uh, there's multiple <coughs> multiple things that can happen that are bad. So uh, I'm going to explain those to you now, but I'm going to actually draw you some pictures. Uh, I'm not an artist, so just take it easy and bear with me, but I think if you see the pictures, it'll it'll explain it a little more clearly, so I'm going to draw you some pictures and show you that way. And as I speak, I'll draw. Alright, so here we go. So when you drill a well, you'll, you'll start the well out, and when you start it out, there's you actually drill surface pipe. And you drill it to about, on average, about uh, 2,000 feet. So you have this surface pipe, and this is a, a bigger hole. This would be ground level. Can you see that? There you go. Ground level. Here's your first 2,000 feet of surface pipe. <coughs> and you run that. The, uh, our, our, our drinking water is usually within the first few hundred feet. So your drinking water would be about right here, we'll say. Here in this area. This would be drinking water. So we drill down about 2,000 feet. And we set surface pipe. And here's our hole. And then we run this, this pipe that's not quite as big. But then we cement it, and we cement all the way through here, and this whole backside is filled with cement all the way up. And if it doesn't get all the way to surface, because sometimes it doesn't, because you have lost circulation and stuff, then you, then you do a top job, which is pumping cement from the top of the hole in the backside with one-inch pipe and fill this up to surface. So all this is full, and this is what you have. And then <coughs> you start your, produ you start your pro <coughs> sorry, production hole. And it's a smaller hole. This right here would be... 12, 12 and a quarter bit and 9 and 5 eighths or if it's Anadarko 8 and 5 eighths 8 inch casing uh, but that's what size that hole is then you drill another 8 inch hole so you drill another 8 inch hole all the way down to TD and you drill this with a 7 and 7 eighths inch bit or different size bits just it matters but this is just one example, okay? We drill down to TD, we'll say 10,000 feet. 10,000. Remember, this was uh, 2,000. Trying to write backwards is... I'm not very good. But anyway, and this was in the hundreds. Water. Okay, but anyway, so... You drill down through here, so then you have this 8-inch hole this big. Well, then you run your production string. And your production string goes from surface all the way down to the bottom of the hole at TD. And it's a 4.5-inch pipe usually, sometimes 5-inch, just depends on what you're doing. But anyway, when you're drilling a well, what you do is you, you, you have a bit on the end, and you're drilling up this right here. This I'm just showing you so that you understand. We, we pump fluid down the pipe, down the inside of the pipe. And it comes out the bit, and that's what brings our cuttings up. And it brings the cuttings back up this open hole over here and brings the cuttings up. And that's how we get them back to surface. Well, when you run production pipe, you do the same thing to cement the well. Because when you run this 4.5 inch pipe, you have this void right here. You have this voided area. It's just empty. Because the production, this is an 8 inch hole, and this production pipe is only 4.5 inch diameter. So, uh... You have this void around it. So that's what you do. You pump cement down the pipe, and then you displace behind the cement. You pump water, which displaces it out of the pipe, pushes the cement out of the pipe, and, and into this area, and you fill this void with cement. And what that does is, is it stabilizes the casing, which is one thing, but it also, it also fills this void and makes a solid solid barrier between the casing and the formation and fills this void so that you don't have communication between your uh, <coughs> between your formations because you have uh, let's say the Wasatch is right here and down here you have the Mesa Verde okay it you don't want these two to communicate to each other because this is a pay zone this is a pay zone then all the way up here is the water zone and you don't want these two this is all cemented in now too as well usually up into it quite a ways but anyway, it, it, 
there, there's a lot of complications that can come from that. It, it, first of all, it's illegal. You can't have formations communicating because it, it, it causes major problems. Plus, the higher pressure formation will, will blow into the lower pressure formation, and then it can break it up and ruin it. So what happens is, what really causes communication between formations is bad cement jobs. And there's practices that will stop that from happening. And the <clears throat> practices are, uh, among other things, you run centralizers, you reciprocate the pipe, move the pipe up and down while you're cementing. You, uh, there's lots of methods that we do to ensure that we get good cement jobs. And the reason why, if you want me to be honest with you, the reason why you want good cement jobs isn't because you're worried about contaminating water, okay? Don't get me wrong, we don't want to contaminate water, nobody wants to nobody wants to cause harm that we don't need to. But the reason why is because if you if let's say that the Wasatch was to actually communicate with the surface water, well first of all it's totally unprofitable because it ruins the well. I mean you get you don't want water into your well at all and you don't want gas into this this shallow formation. If this Wasatch gas is communicating with this hundred foot down water aquifer, it's going to cause major problems. It's not going to be, it's going to cause you major money, major problems, and ruin the well. So it's totally unprofitable. If you, if you communicate with the water, you probably ruined the well. That's just the truth, or made it extremely unprofitable. Not to mention you caused harm. But this is what, this is, this is the real true deal. Okay, here we are. Let me erase this stuff. And what happens after we cement this? We have our pay zones down here. Wasatch is usually five or six thousand feet. Remember, water is at a hundred. This is H two O. H. Uh, I suck. H two O. And well, I guess the two needs to be H two O. Water about a hundred feet. Surface pipe ran to two thousand totally cemented. So you have this surface pipe that's cemented into itself. Then you have four and a half ran inside of it that's cemented. So from the actual well bore to the water you have two sets of iron pipe and two sets of cement jobs between them. So it's actually probably more contained and separated from these wells than it ever could have been. But then you also have about 5,000 foot of earth and about what uh, eight nine thousand foot of earth, and then another ten thousand foot of earth between these pay zones. So what fracking is really is after after the drilling rig leaves, which is what I do. After we leave, they run down a tool. They run down a tool that sets a plug. Here's uh, the mesa. We'll say they set a plug, and it's a perforation tool, and it's actually a charge that blows shoots. Uh, BBs or they do percussion, uh, percussion, they do different types, but anyway, it breaks the holes in the casing and shoots into the formation, and it shoots holes into it through the cement, <clears throat> and then they actually use acid, and the acid breaks back, acid is just low pH, I mean, that's what acid is, a pH of 4, but anyway, uh, they pump acid, and that breaks the cement back, and then they start pumping their water and fluid, and they pump it into these these holes and it breaks them open and it actually what it does is it makes a it makes a wedge it cracks them open into a wedge like that and it, they pump in a bunch of sand and water and then they they add chemicals they add chemicals that actually uh, that actually carry make the water thicker with gel and extremely viscous to carry the sand and then they run chemicals that once the sands in there and the water's in there they have what's called a breaker and it breaks the it breaks the water back to water thin water so then the water flows back into the well and the sand stays it drops the sand because actual plain water can't carry sand it's not viscous enough it doesn't have enough viscosity so when it breaks back to water from that chemical that breaker it leaves the sand there and it leaves these formations pushed open and that's what allows the oil and gas to flow back through. Okay, this is uh this is a mile away from the drinking water. So fracking is it's highly it's almost impossible that fracking would get do this, you know. But that's just the truth. Now, bad cement jobs, bad cement job at surface, bad cement job on your production can cause issues. 
can cause issues. You know, you might have a bad cement job. You might have a decent cement job at surface, but it's got some issues with it, and you have a bad cement job uh, in your production, and it leaks into itself and gets into your water. And that's that's a bad practice, and it, it has happened, and it can happen. But there's there's ways to know. Okay, if you don't get cement back to where you're supposed to, you run excess cement, it doesn't come back to surface, you have an idea. You run a top job. And you do a C, uh, uh, <coughs> CBL, a cement bond log. You you can actually run a survey, or not a survey, a logging tool type, or I, I don't know, it's a, it's a cement bond log. And they check the density in between here, and they can see with their tool if you have good contact between your casing and your cement. So they can tell. And if there's not, then they can perf and cement and do squeeze jobs or whatever they need to do to fix the problem. It's fixable long before it would ever cause contamination. So that's that's the problem that would happen with cement. And that is a scribbled up mess and probably makes absolutely no sense. Pay no attention to this. <laughs> this is some of my kids' homeschool stuff and yeah, I don't... Sorry, that's kind of embarrassing that I use the same board, but oh well, who cares. But anyway, that's that's what can really cause contamination is a cement job. And then I'm going to explain one more method, or bad practice, not method, bad practice that can also really harm wells and cause bad, bad problems. All right, <clears throat> so the, the, next, uh, the next bad practice that would cause uh, contamination uh, between communication between zones and possibly to the water would be a, a, an underground blowout when you're con when you're containing a well when you're putting a well in the choke and containing a blowout when we uh, when we drill the well we'll just say this is all our eight inch hole well <clears throat> you're drilling along and you get gas into it you get gas into your well you have to shut it in and what that does is it uh, you you shut the well in so that nothing can get out and it and and you maintain a pressure that keeps this gas from any more from getting in and then you bleed off out through your choke as you're circulating down your string also I hope this makes sense but you control by maintaining a certain amount of pressure inside the hole and you circulate around and circulate this gas out while maintaining a high enough pressure inside the hole to not allow any more gas in from the from the well and to allow you to circulate this gas up and then out and then burn it off so but while you're doing that right here we'll say this is our shoe our surface pipe from the last little piece of video we did remember the surface pipe was the 2000 foot stuff well you need to maintain a pressure but you can't you have a certain pressure at your shoe that you cannot exceed <clears throat> or anywhere in the well because what you'll do is you'll you you will frack the well because this is open hole it's not pipe right now this is open hole this is just the hole you drilled so you will actually frack and cause cause contamination because you have your you have your returns where it's coming out the fluids going out you're circulating around and getting this gas out but you have it choked back at a choke right here so you're controlling a valve that's only allowing you to let out so much fluid well if you shut that valve too much and don't and build up too much pressure inside your hole you will break the formation back the same way that fracking does but this isn't in a controlled manner in fracking you have your perfs and you 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 set up that's what you're doing you're watching the pressure you're watching everything you can when you're fracking if you if you break the formation in a bad way to where you have communication with something else you know because you have pressure loss well we're not set up to do that we are set up to do other things and we can't frack the formation because it's not in a controlled manner. We're not going through perfs in pay zones. We would be doing it at the weakest point, which would be the shoe. So it would be the closest to surface, which in most of the work that I do, you're about 2,000 feet. So if you did, you'd probably be, you're probably not going to get to the drinking water still. I mean, that's just the truth, you know. 
But what you'll do, and why it's a bad practice, is that you'll eject this gas into some surface. You, you'll put this gas from down here at this mesa verde. You know, that's where it's coming from. We'll say, well, it'd be down here where you just drilled into it. You're taking this mesa verde gas and you're circulating it up and then you're blowing it out at the shoe because you're maintaining too much pressure on your open hole and you're pushing this gas into surface gas. So then what it does is, I mean, if it's bad enough, you'll get to the surface water and cause contamination. And that's why I'm telling you about it because it's a possibility. That is a true possibility to have that happen. Have you do small fractures that reach the surface water by having a downhole blowout, by not knowing what you're doing when you're shutting a well in and not knowing that you need to maintain your pressure but not exceed your casing pressure. And if you do, it's really bad, especially if you have a pressure loss. If you have your choke shut in and you're maintaining your pressure and you shut it too much for some reason on accident or something happens, whatever it may be, and you exceed your uh, shoe pressure and you have a pressure loss because of it, you just caused a major problem. But anyway, it's bad in more ways than just reaching the water. Uh, what else can happen is that you'll pump this mesa gas, all these units, into, let's say right here, about a thousand feet or two thousand feet, whatever, at two thousand feet. So then the next person comes along and they get a lease and they're drilling along and, th and they're doing surface and they're supposed, you know, they, they kind of know the area. They know they get to, uh, down to about two thousand feet with no real gas issues. So they're not really worried about it. They just have a diverter to divert their fluid. They don't really have any blowout prevention. And they're drilling along and they drill into what you planted there when you were there and you blow it out. And really, from you being there five years ago, you set them up to burn their rig down. So they drill into this mesa gas that's at 1,000 feet or 2,000 feet and, you know, have major issues and major complications because they're not ready for it and they're not even set up to deal with it. So that's why it's extremely important to know what you're doing when you shut in a well. But anyway, uh, those are the real true... Uh, the real true ways that you can really hurt water, drinking water, or just the environment when you're drilling well. There's multiple ways, but they're all bad practices. They're all they're all bad practices, and we don't we don't do them. Okay, it's it's this is uh sorry let me this is. <clears throat> This is a technology in a field that's that's technologically advanced beyond anything you could imagine. Okay, this isn't the oil field that you know from even 10 years ago, especially 20, 30 years ago. This is top. I deal with technology that is unreal, and and the knowledge that we've obtained through the years of drilling these wells has helped us make them in a productive, safe, and lucrative manner. They're extremely lucrative. We don't need to cut corners or cause injury to uh, to make money we we don't it's it the, the most expensive thing and, it, and it's not because oh it's human life I mean to me it is and to you it is but to a big corporation it's money okay if this corporation hurts or injures somebody that that costs more than anything and if they're hurting and <laughs> injuring lots of people through water contamination or whatever it may be that costs lots and lots of money it's not it's not, it's not, sorry, I lost my word, I, I get retarded, it's not profitable, okay, it's not profitable to hurt people, and whether it's in drinking water or whatever it is, it's just not, it, this is an extremely lucrative field, they make a lot of money and they can make it by doing things right, and, and, and really what we found over the last 20 years is that doing things right is more profitable, it's more profitable. It, it is. I mean, in every manner, uh, as far as making sure that we're not communicating between wells, it's more profitable because the well comes on better. You get better control of the production. If your wells are communicating, you don't have any control over that, and it, it, it's just not profitable. Profit is really what matters, and that's the truth, and that's sad, but that's the truth to, to a corporation. I mean, that's just how they're ran, but the profit is in safety and being safe and not injuring or hurting people and that's the truth and I thank you for your time and that's pretty much all I have to say so goodbye